Hi friends, I hope this finds you well. So um, I just wanted to quickly do a, a few little uh, interesting thing, uh, stories that I saw online and one was that the Brazilian students are staging uh, new mass protests against Bolsonaro's education reform. Um, you may not be following uh, what's happening in Brazil. Um, I have a very bare understanding of it, except that uh, I know that Bolsonaro is literally a fascist. He's a fascist president. And, uh, c of course, coming along with fascism, you'll get uh, cuts to social services and vilifying of journalists. And um, in this case, uh, there's a whole bunch of, there's a whole list of things that fascists do. And one of them is cutting back on public services. And in this case, uh, Bolsonaro has cut back on public education by about 30%. And so a whole lot of students, and this is great to see, have come out against these cuts and um, huge protests in the streets of Brazil. That's an excellent uh, thing that's happening. And uh, the other good thing that's happening is because is that um, because Bolsonaro is so obviously fascist and he's, uh, I, I don't know who voted him in, and, um, I'm, and I know that uh, the U.S. was meddling for quite a while before he got in, uh, as they do, but um, uh, fortunately the, his opinion, the public opinion is dropping significantly uh, towards him. Now it's on the side of people um, uh, turning against him, which is really excellent. Um, I was a bit worried that... Um, it may just, uh, I was a bit worried that he might, um, that it might take a while for people to do that, but it's, he's only been in office about five months and, and, uh, there's already, um, he's already dr dropping in the public opinion. So, um, that's great to see. And speaking about, um, governments that are not doing so well, um, Netanyahu is having trouble forming the, um, the government. And so that's, uh, is probably going to be another election of course that doesn't really mean a whole a great deal because the public um i think there was a, um, a report done recently where 50 percent of israelis actually believe in ethnic cleansing so that's when you have that kind of um uh, that kind of those kind of social attitudes you're going to get really really right-wing genocidal uh, promoting um you know sort of prime ministers and that was Netanyahu and whoever replaces him, if he is replaced in the future, will be possibly somebody worse. And uh, normally I never ever do stories about Donald Trump. I talk about the US empire because really it doesn't matter in many ways who is in the front puppet position um, in, you know, in the US government. But um, I thought you, I would bring your attention to uh, a story that came out a few days ago uh, by the Real News Network, and it was about um, the it was about Jared, Jared Kushner and um, how he's been using uh, Deutsche Bank to to launder money, and which is uh, quite interesting. And um, I invite you to check it out. Um, just briefly, from what I understand, um, they've been using uh, well Donald Trump. Actually, he even had r Russian oligarchs just below him where he was living in the Trump Towers. Um, who were um, actually laundering money through this 24-hour gambling that they had going. Deutsche Bank, who um, has um, apparently, allegedly, Jared Kushner has been, and possibly Donald Trump, I'm not sure, has been using the Deutsche Bank to launder money. And the Deutsche Bank has already paid over $600 million in fines for laundering money for uh, wealthy Russians, Cyprus, Germany, and the United States. And this is according to um, K. Johnston, C. A. Y. J. O. H. N. S. T. O. N. Who has written a book, "The Making of Donald Trump," I think it's called, and um, it's really, it's really, really interesting video and um, from the Real News Network. And so, do check it out. The thing about um, corruption, and there's so much of it now in politics, and has been for a long time, but it's sort of, it's it's in plain sight and it's just laughable and it's if if it, it's sort of tragic in a way because there are people going to prison for fifteen for parking fines and not being able to get out and they keep getting more and more expenses and then they end up staying there for years and years and uh, in in the United States and here we have people in plain sight laundering money um, that are in the highest offices in the country. And uh, I'd be surprised if anything happens with this. I, I, you know, there's all these talk of indictment of, uh, sorry, impeachment of Donald Trump. I mean, Hillary Clinton could have been um, 
should be in jail. There, there are a whole lot of people, the people that take lobbyist money in Congress, and most of them do. I mean, that's like just bribes, really. Um, they put forward bills that are in favour of these lobbyists. Um, I mean, this goes on all the time. So, uh, and that's why I don't particularly follow, I don't particularly worry too much about this open corruption or even the closed corruption because it's everywhere, it's rampant. It's not only in the US, of course, it's all over the place. It's in our, in my government here in Australia, not as bad as the US, but it's sort of, it's getting there where things that are openly corrupt are just, there's no, there's no uh, consequences, no consequences for any of these, this corruption. And so, if there's no consequences, then what's going to stop politicians from continuing on doing that? And it's the same in the U.S. government. There's there's no real consequences. And none of those people who are in the government, Hillary Clinton, Chuck Schumer, and all those people in the Democratic Party and any of the GOP or whatever, they have they don't want to put one another in jail because, it's as, as George Carlin said, it's one big club and we're not in it. And even though they may not like Donald Trump, I don't think he'll ever see the inside of a prison and I don't really think Jared Kushner will ever see the inside of a prison. And there's nepotism going on left and right in the Trump administration. You know, what on earth is Ivanka Trump doing running around? She has no experience in any of this. And she's running around helping make deals for her own private companies. You know, they're, they're all doing this. Donald Trump probably sees this whole presidency as a way of lining his pockets when he gets out. You know, he's done so many favors for different corporations. I mean, you know, that will make him very wealthy, even though... He's been lying about his wealth for a long time, as as is evidenced by the author of The Making of Donald Trump, where in the early 90s he was sort of stating that Donald Trump uh, was not as wealthy as he said, and Donald Trump, uh, you know, sort of was, you know, he's got such an ego. Um, he w- flew off the handle about that, but in, in, in many ways that was true. You, and he's trying to stop um, the Deutsche Bank, Donald Trump is trying to stop the Deutsche Bank from releasing any information. I'm not sure why Deutsche Bank in this case, even though it's 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 really not a bank, it's like um, a criminal institution, which has been fined, yes, as I mentioned, $600 million for um, laundering money um, for various wealthy oligarchs, Russian oligarchs, etc. Uh, I don't know why they're deciding to cooperate. Um, maybe they sort of see the tides are turning and they think they should. I have no idea. But anyway, Donald Trump is trying to stop them from releasing any information about his business dealings. Um, it would be great to see the, these sort of people, not just Donald Trump, but Hillary Clinton, who's been... Hillary Clinton and Bill Clinton have been doing... Um, they've been doing all sorts of corrupt things for a very long time. And uh, there are others. There's heaps of others. I mean, seriously, like like somebody said at one point... All these uh, Congress members should have their sponsors, you know, on their shirts when they go into Congress, you know, <laughs> the weapons industry, big pharma and so forth. Um, so anyway, uh, but but this is a, a sort of a, would be an interesting one. It's an interesting one to just check out because, um, I mean, it's just laughable. <laughs> like, and the interesting thing I find is this is all political too, even though, yes, he's he's got lots of corrupt dealings going on, Donald Trump, for sure. As I said, this whole presidency is really, he just sees that as a, as a means to an end to to f- further line his pockets in the future for his businesses. That's, that's what I think. Um, I, I, I don't even think he really wanted to be president. Um, I, he probably didn't even think he was going to win. So, um, and I, I don't think Melania Trump wanted to uh, be a first lady. But anyway, who knows? Who knows what, what was going on there? But, but um, the thing is, they could have found all this out before he was... Um, before his inauguration as president, the FBI could have found out all of this easily. This man, uh, the, this author, Dave, I think it's David K. Johnson, he was writing about this. Um, he had that book out, uh, you know, in the early, I don't know when he released it, but he's doing investigations in the 90s. It's all very clear that he's had corrupt dealings, um, business dealings. So they could have found that out before he became president. And they could have, you know, basically written him off. But this is this is all about... If you don't have the Russiagate thing, you know, the Russiagate thing was to cover up, partly was to cover up Hillary Clinton's, uh, you know, the um, DNC, um, the pedestrian emails that were re- released by WikiLeaks, which showed Hillary Clinton's corruption. And then they made it out that it was Russia hacking. Instead, it was actually a leak, um, a leak by someone within the DNC. Some say Seth Rich, who was murdered. 
but um, it, whoever it was, um, they leaked to WikiLeaks. And so there was all these pedestrian emails out there, and that helped. Of course, Hillary Clinton wasn't popular anyway, but it, that all assisted in uh, exposing her corruption. And she also was promoting Donald Trump in the, the Pied Piper strategy, as, as the um, as her campaign called it in these pedestrian emails. The Pied Piper strategy was to elevate Dom- Donald Trump so that they had somebody that they thought was an easy win. Well, that didn't turn out very well, did it? So Hillary Clinton lost to well, lost an, what you would possibly call an unlosable election. Anyway, so um, if there is such a thing. So so what I'm trying to say is that now that they haven't got the Russiagate uh, so much, of course they're keeping that going anyway, despite Mueller investigations and all of that. Um, they're keeping that going in the mainstream media because that was a great way of bringing in money for the people were tuning in like it was some sort of reality TV show. So they got lots of um, advertising for that. But really, that was all. That's all political. Um, that was all political to just keep that going against Donald Trump to help make it easier. They think make it easier for the Democrats to win in the twenty twenty election, and and um, and this I see is just a political, another political stunt too that they could have done way before he even was inaugurated, but they've decided to do that now, and the timing is very interesting. So um, you know. They they just take the public as fools, really. Take us all as fools, like we. They just manipulate the media, manipulates it, and um, I, I just find it so sad and it's kind of offensive that these sort of things come out now, um, when they could have been cleared up way before. He never would have become president if they'd actually done their job, the FBI and all of that. And most of those people wouldn't, really. I mean, Hillary Clinton, if they'd done serious investigations with her. If she, you know, she would not have become president. All these people sort of have corruption somewhere along the line. And and I, as I said, the Cong- Congress people, they all take lobbyist money, and I see that as just open bribes to put forward, you know, bills that are in favour of these corporations. So I feel I, it's all corrupt. They also get sort of insider trading information because they can see something happening that's going to happen in the future, these Congress members, and they can... It's its basically insider trading, really, but it's actually apparently legal. So anyhow, um, so check that out. I'll leave... Um, if I remember, I'll leave a link to it, the Real News Network, and the the name of the... The name of the video is called Deutsche Bank, Trump's Money Laundering Criminal Organization. So interesting that came up was that um, video games are, have been used for quite some time now to, um, to recruit uh, children to the military, and this most recent one um, not only would be doing that, but also was just straight-out propaganda, this Call of Duty. I think it's called Call of Duty, um, and it's basically just modern propaganda. I mean, they had they had one. Um, I, I don't know if it's the same people that make Call of Duty, but um, they had one where it was sort of a vilification of Ven- um a vilification of um, Chavez. This was um, a, fa- a fair while ago. Um, you know, basically, it's just all propaganda about the U.S. being the good good guys as usual. I mean, look how they rewritten World War Two as if they um, were the ones that helped win. You know, they were the major ones that helped win the war when it was really Russians who lost millions and millions of people, soldiers, for that war. But anyway, so in this particular Call of Duty thing. Call of Duty video game that's coming out. There's, um, you know, the Russians are using nerve gas on people, uh, and it's it doesn't mention Syria, but it's some something that looks pretty much like a Syrian situation. And they actually have the sort of white helmets in there, and the white helmets are kind of heroes. And this protagonist in this video is helping the white helmets, and the Russians are just executing people left and right. And so it's a big. Russophobia, a big anti-Russian propaganda um, video game, and I guess that's to condition young people who who love these games to um, have sort of anti-Russian feelings, so that when eventually they either the U.S. either gets their way and either uh, invade, you know, sort of I don't know how they could do this without there being mutually assured destruction, but they do want to eventually dis destroy Russia and China um, but you know that the one Russia is probably the one that's uh, the most um, can hold its own against the US Empire in relation to having superior nuclear weapons but um you know when they just 
sort of trying to create anti-Russian um, and Russophobia basically with young people. And this is this is in you know these video games. So I just found that really amazing that even though the white helmets have been proven now to not only be sort of uh, doubling as ISIS and um, Al Nusra and all of this, but they they've also been organ trading and all sorts of things in Syria. And here is this ridiculous uh, video game. Um, sort of lauding them as kind of heroic um, and, you know, as heroes. Um, you know, you couldn't make this up. But anyway, so I'm just going to quickly talk about Julian Assange. Um, it's kind of awful not knowing where he's at as far as his health goes um, in the Belmarsh Prison Hospital there. If that's a hospital, I don't know what kind of treatment he gets there. But, um, you know, it, the last report is that he's really probably gravely ill, possibly terminal. Um, it's very sad to see his mother on Twitter sort of, you know, with these kind of desperate pleas for help and stuff like that. It's really criminal and cruel. But uh, there was one sort of doctor who, uh, well, the, 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 the UN Rapporteur on Torture gave an extensive report about um, Julian Assange, and you can find that online. And uh, he said it's just been psychological and physical torture for him and that he find, he's done a lot of investigations into torture over the a few decades, and he says it's quite shocking what's being done to him, a systematic sort of a persecution by governments, basically. And one particular doctor, Dr. Crosby, said during seven years of confinement, Assange has suffered a number of serious uh, deleterious effects of sunlight deprivation, including neuropsychological impairment, weakened bones, decreased immune function and increased risk of cardiovascular disease and cancer. Assange also displayed physical and psychological symptoms as a result of, quote, prolonged social isolation and sensory deprivation, end quote. Quote, I believe the psychological, physical and social after effects will be long lasting and severe, Dr. Crosby wrote. And there's an Intercept article. I'm not a huge fan of the Intercept for a number of reasons, but they've written an article and it's by James Risen and it's called Julian Assange suffered severe psychological and physical harm in the Ecuadorian embassy, doctors say. The UN Rapporteur on Torture said, uh, reports on Julian's condition, quote, what was worrying was the psychological side in his constant anxiety and his constant anxiety. It was perceptible that he had a sense of being under threat from everyone. He understood that my function was, but uh, he understood what my function was, but it's more that he was extremely agitated and busy with his own thoughts. It was difficult to have a very structured conversation with him. In the course of the past nine years, Mr. Assange um, has been exposed to persistent, progressively severe abuse, ranging from systemic judicial persecution and arbitrary confinement in the Ecuadorian embassy to his oppressive isolation, harassment and surveillance inside the embassy, and from deliberate collective ridicule, insults and humiliation to open instigation of violence and even repeated calls for his assassination. And that's what Melsa said recently. Uh, that's the UN Rapporteur on Torture. And he visited Julian Assange in prison. So uh, that's really, really awful and um, something that's not surprising. But you can see by uh, when I mentioned the other day that, um, you know, having no uh, real sunlight, even if he was taking vitamin D supplements, um, even just that alone, you can get all sorts of serious life-threatening illnesses from D deficiency, uh, in which a lot of people don't even realize that there's extensive D deficiency, widespread D deficiency in the world today. Um, somebody that's close to me who was getting plenty of sun, actually, when they had their D, D levels checked, they were dangerously low, and that can lead to diabetes and cancer and all sorts of things. And that's why, you know, um, I, I would... In, I would sort of suggest to everybody, no matter, particularly if you have a lot of melanin, melanin in your skin, um, if you're dark skinned, um, you know, particularly like black people, to take vitamin D because it's uh, particularly in. Um, I, I would say that's probably one of the reasons why there's a lot of diabetes in black communities is because of that, um, and also diet, of course, is very important. But um, anyway, so um, you know, he uh, Julian Assange. I don't know if, I hope he was taking vitamin D, but it's it's not surprising that he has all these neurological problems and, you know, just from the awful situation. And then on top of that, lack of sunlight and lack of exercise and all of that. Honestly, 
over the years, I, I, I've thought about him and I've just thought, here I am being able to walk around in the sun and do whatever I want and go out. You know, even if I spend, if I spend even just one day where I haven't gone outside the house, I, if I feel strange. You know, it, it, it sort of can be a little bit sort of dampening on your happiness in a way, you know, if, if you don't sort of get out sometime. That's just one day. And this man has spent seven years in a small room, um, you know, and I, I don't, what an incredible um, amount of resilience he has. But still, you know, he's just human. And this has just turned, this has just turned out so terribly. They, they really have been trying to kill him. It's very clear that you cannot, as a human being, you know, it, you cannot really keep your health mentally or physically, mentally or physically in a situation like that. And they know that. So this is, this is the way of assassinating people without actually assassinating them. One, this is last but not least, I was going to talk about, and uh, this is very, very sad. And of course, it's, it's very, very important. And I, I've actually interviewed uh, the person they refer to here, Jerry Georgatis, um, Georgatis. He's a former coordinator of the federally funded National Indigenous Critical Response Service. And he was, he's was he been warning, um, I, I interviewed him uh, when I was able to do live streams before my rural connection from the National Broadcast Network became so poor that, um, you know, I had terrible speeds and it wasn't possible anymore to do live streams, sadly. So, um, but when I was able to um, last about, uh, you know, a year ago, I interviewed um, Jerry, and um, it was unfortunately the sound on his side wasn't very good. So you can look for that interview, and you might be able to hear what he has to say. But um, he's very interesting. He's a wonderful person, and he happens to be vegan too, so that's really great. As you know, uh, I talk about veganism um, on a regular basis, not not as much as I'd like to, so I'm going to increase that <laughs> regularity. But uh, anyway, Jerry... Um, Jerry, so he was talking about how the rate of uh, youth suicides, Indigenous youth suicides, it's just gone through the roof. And um, the new statistics, uh, which were revealed by Jerry Jogartis, um, said that, you know, this crisis is going on unabated. This is mostly in Queensland, Australia, where uh, there's an increase in youth, Indigenous youth suicides. He said, quote, we need to tell the grim reality, end quote, said Mr. Jogartis who now leads the National Critical Response Trauma Recovery Project, which has a suicide prevention fo focus. And Jerry continues, quote, until governments take heed and focus, more children than ever before will be lost, end quote. Um, so almost a third of Indigenous suicides this year have occurred in Queensland, and the rate in the state appears to be increasing. About 5% of Australian children under 17 are Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander, but 40% of the children who took their lives last year were Indigenous. Of the 77 Indigenous people who have killed themselves this year, 74 were living below poverty line, 71 lived in social housing, and and three were homeless. Um, and it, it talks about a young, a young girl who was 16 who recently killed herself. I mean, it's just so... I don't know. I, I don't know. It's, it's a terrible thing. And... Uh, I don't think the government, the Australian government doesn't take it seriously uh, and and how on earth, um, when you're Indigenous too and the kind of, you know, sort of traditions and, uh, and being close to the land and all of that and seeing what we are doing in Australia to the land, um, it's, it's, you know, and then the neoliberal um, and neoconservative uh, governments that we've been getting and so how it's all sort of in favour of corporations just doing this and that and whatever, they, in some ways, whatever they want, eventually they get what they want. It's no wonder. And also just the racism and all of that, all these combination, the poverty, the racism, uh, the devaluing of Indigenous culture in many ways, even though people give token nods to Indigenous culture every time they make a speech, like politicians, but really what are they actually doing? Um, and... Uh, you know, it's a sort of a, a just, you know, this youth suicide just is a, gives you a, gives us a really clear idea of how hopeless a lot of young Indigenous people feel. And I'm not sure in what in particular is going on in Queensland, 
I don't know if there's been an increase in racism in Queensland and that was indicated by the recent election results. I don't know. I, I'm not sure. I, I know that One Nation, uh, that's a party that has a lot of racist um, policies, racist rhetoric. Um, I don't know if, you know, if that's worse in Queensland. But anyway, it's just something that's just awful. And um, if ever I'm able to do live streams again or um, have a decent connection, I hope to maybe interview Jerry uh, again one day. There's a little cat outside the door wants to come in and visit. <laughs> um, anyway, the name of that article is called um, Broken Hearts of a Nation and 77 Souls. Um, so you can find that uh, in the Australian that's not at all a newspaper, a news source that I like, the a Murdoch Press, I think, but um, or at least some conservative, um, unfortunate. But they the, apparently this is in yeah the Australian, so that's that's something good that they've done. Just one more thing about Julian Assange, um, I I hope that they will release some information about his situation soon, so that uh, we can uh, find out really how how bad things are. I really, really hope that he pulls through because I feel like with the increase in mainstream media talking about actually starting to freak out about their own lives and their own careers with this um, impending ex extradition of Julian Assange to the US to face 175 years in prison for espionage, uh, even though he was just doing the job of a journalist that every other journalist does all over the world. But... Um, they are starting, the mainstream media now is starting to freak out about their own personal lives. And so that might change the public, um, the public's opinion. And it also might make it easier for um, the sort of morally deficient, uh, I don't know what you call it, these pe people that lack courage, politicians that lack courage, that um, they might start actually speaking out and maybe in a, my own country actually start talking about it. I won't hold my breath, but I'm hoping that um, because the mainstream media is starting to freak out about their own careers and lives, that this might actually turn things around a little bit. And if Julian Assange actually does not die in Belmarsh Prison, which unfortunately is looking more and more like it might be the case, um, that uh, he may have a small, he might have a small chance of actually not being extradited because of the change in climate in the mainstream media. And maybe some politicians might start saying something. Who knows? I don't know. Um, everything is so sort of sewn up these days. The mainstream media, politicians being U.S. lackeys and all of that. I don't won't. I don't hold much hope. But anyway, you, I suppose you just have to have some hope and and good thoughts that that the truth um, overcomes the the, the the right ends up um, being victorious in this case. So anyway, that's all I wanted to say. Uh, please subscribe if you haven't already subscribed. Please um, click the uh, notifications bell, otherwise you don't receive updates when I drop a video. If you're watching this somewhere on social media, please consider subscribing to my channel on Faint Signals from Vega because I only post selected content on social media. I don't post everything that I do. Um, everything that I do is usually just on this channel. And uh, please click the like button if you like the content and please leave comments. I always enjoy comments. So thanks so much for watching. My name is Trish Roberts. You're watching Faint Signals from Vega. Till next time. Bye for now.